Your first job is a rite of passage. For 16-year-old Molly Bish, her first job was her last. One sunny morning, only minutes after she got to work, someone lured her away from her lifeguard chair. Three years later, her blue bathing suit turned up in the woods. This case is still unsolved, but here's what you need to know about the case and the suspects. Let's recap. Only about 4,975 people live in the teeny town of Warren, Massachusetts. It's a family place, the kind of town where you can walk at night without looking over your shoulder. A tight-knit community where you can raise your kids and watch the national news on TV and think, thank God I don't live there. That's pretty much exactly why the Bish family moved to Warren from Detroit. They thought it would be a safe place to raise a family, and it was, until the summer of 2000. That's when 16-year-old Molly Bish followed in her older brother footsteps and scored a gig as a lifeguard. You could say the Bish children were like the protectors of Coman's Pond. Her brother held the title for three years, then he trained his little sister, but Molly only held the title for eight days. If you're picturing a crowded swimming area with concrete locker rooms, a snack bar, and the pervasive smell of chlorine in the air, think again. Coman's Pond is a tranquil reserve surrounded by thick forest. It's remote and isolated. If you're looking for an old-fashioned swimming hole kind of spot, you found it. If you're in to fishing, this is the spot for that too. The lifeguard's chair sits alone where the edge of the sandy beach meets the tree line. Molly spent her days watching the swimmers. Ironically, she was the one in danger. Her quiet New England town is about to become the setting for one of Massachusetts' most notorious mysteries. It's Monday, June 26, 2000, and Maggie Bish is dropping off her daughter Molly at work. Typically, the parking lot is close to empty in the mornings, but that morning, Maggie sees a strange man with a a distinctive thick mustache sitting in a white sedan when they pull in. He's probably somewhere around 45 or 55 with dark eyes and dark hair, a little salt and peppered on the sides. He's just sitting in the parking lot smoking a cigarette. Now the way he's holding it is weird, memorable. The guy is giving off a very creepy vibe, so Maggie walks Molly down to the beach. On her way back, she stares hard at the mustache man in the white car. He stares back just as hard. It's unnerving enough that Maggie waits 20 minutes for him to drive away before she leaves. The next day, Molly's running late. She's supposed to be all set up and in her chair by 10 a.m., but at 9.50 a.m., mother and daughter are caught on security camera buying a bottle of water at a convenience store. At 9.56, they check in at the Warren Police Department to pick up her two-way radio. Maggie pulls into the Coman's Pond parking lot at 9.58 a.m. She looks around for the man in the white car, but there's no sign of him today. Today is the first day of swimming lessons. They expect to see plenty of cars in the lot, but the only view vehicle around is a county truck dropping fresh sand on the beach. The first family shows up for a day of swimming around 10.20 a.m. Molly, the lifeguard, is nowhere to be seen. Her things are all laid out like she's coming right back. Her towel, shoes, backpack, water bottle, and police radio are all still there. The only thing out of place is the first aid kit. It's open. By noon, one or two moms had called the parks department to complain there was no lifeguard on duty. Maggie got the call around 1 p.m. It doesn't make sense. Molly loves her job, it's not like her to get up and walk away. Did she drown? Her family is skeptical. Molly is a strong swimmer. Her brother trained her for the lifeguard job himself, but divers comb the lake searching for the 16-year-old anyway. Meanwhile, dozens of people trample the sand around her things, destroying any evidence that might have been left behind. Police dogs eventually trace her scent to the end of a trail winding through the woods that connects the beach with the local cemetery. Did someone lure her away from her post by pretending to be hurt? Did she turn around around to open her first aid kit before she was grabbed? The initial investigation focuses on the mustache man in the white car. Police release a composite sketch to the public with a special detail. In it, the suspect is drawn holding a cigarette. Maggie described the way he held it as feminine, a detail that'll come back later. She didn't see the white car when she pulled into the parking lot on the 27th, but other people did. One worker says he saw a similar car parked in the cemetery lot minutes before Maggie arrived. Another witness claims they saw the mistake pistachioed man near the pond earlier that morning. The search for Molly Bish became the most expensive and involved search in Massachusetts history. Hundreds of police officers and volunteers combed through Warren and the surrounding town. Molly's case appeared on TV shows across America, including Unsolved, Disappeared, and America's Most Wanted. Police put every sex offender within 100 miles under the microscope. Eleven men failed a polygraph when they were asked about Molly's disappearance, but none were considered a person 
person of interest. In May of 2003, a former police officer named Tim McGuigan broke the case wide open. While conducting his own unauthorized investigation, Tim spoke with a hunter who found a bathing suit in the woods. The hunter was walking around Whiskey Hill in Palmer, Massachusetts, about 11 miles southwest of Warren, when he found pieces of a blue bathing suit on the forest floor that matched Molly's description. Tim contacted his fellow officers with the tip. Crews searched under every rock on Whiskey Hill until they found what they were looking for. Molly Bish's body. They officially found her bones on June 9, 2003, almost three years after she went missing. Her remains were too decomposed to come up with a cause of death, but anyone with two eyes and a brain could tell it was homicide. For the next 20 years, Molly's investigation hit dead end after dead end. Her story was eerily similar to another missing child case several years before. In 1993, 10-year-old Holly Piranin went missing while walking to her grandmother's house in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Ten weeks later, her remains were found in the woods. Sturbridge is only 10 miles southeast of Warren. As of 2023, Holly's case also remains unsolved. You could call the route between Sturbridge, Warren, and Palmer a missing child triangle in south central Massachusetts. Police had reason to believe Molly and Holly's cases could be connected. One glaring detail is that both girls were the same age. When Molly was 10, she wrote a letter to Holly's family. In it, Molly wrote, I am very sorry. I wish I could make it up to you. Holly is a very pretty girl. She is almost as tall as me. I wish I knew Holly. I hope they found her. Molly even looked a lot like Holly might have looked if she had lived to see her 16th birthday. It's chilling to think the two girls may have suffered the same fate years apart. As of 2023, three names stand out as potential suspects in Molly's case. They are Frank Sumner, Gerald Battistoni, and Rodney Stanger. All three were known to be in the Warren area. All three fit the description of that mustache man in the white car. And all three had violent and sexual criminal pasts. Fortunately, two of the three are dead. Let's start with the police's favorite suspect, Frank Sumner. Frank is the only suspect to be labeled a person of interest in Molly's case. He earned that title a few weeks before the 21st anniversary of her death. He was a sex offender who used to live in Spencer, Massachusetts, about 12 miles east of Warren. In 2021, the district attorney said they had new information linking Frank to Molly Bish, but because it's an active investigation, they still haven't released what the information is. It's worth noting how much Frank looks like the man in the sketch, minus the mustache. He also smoked cigarettes with that same girly way of holding them that Maggie noticed. He had a 20-page criminal record, but police honed in on one charge, aggravated rape and kidnapping. Frank owned a series of auto body shops in the area, and he was known to help himself to his customers' cars, meaning he could have had access to a white car like the one Maggie saw. In the 1980s, a woman stopped by the shop to get her friend's car painted. She and Frank got to talking, and he told her he had an apartment for rent if she wanted to see it. They took a look at the place together and she thought her friend might be interested. Frank offered to pay her if she'd clean the place for him. She took him up on the offer, but when she was done, Frank locked her in a room and sexually assaulted her. He got 15 to 18 years for that, plus 9 to 10 for kidnapping. His driving record shows a traffic ticket in 1998, meaning Frank was out of jail before Molly went missing. Unfortunately, it's impossible to get more answers out of him since he died in 2016. Our next possible suspect is Gerald Battistone. The theories around Gerald stem from a private investigator and a child custody case. Former Vermont State Trooper Dan Malley became a PI later in life. He was working the case on Gerald when he learned some horrifying details. Gerald violated his girlfriend's daughter in 1991. Dan wanted to bring Gerald to justice, but the investigation took him down several new paths. He found the victim, who claims Gerald sexually assaulted her at least 100 times when she was 13 and 16 years old. Other than one child, childhood friend she never told a soul, not until she talked to Dan. Next, Dan learned that Gerald was connected to the Molly Bish and Holly Peranin cases. His victim's mother was a real estate agent. You've seen for rent or for sale signs before, right? They usually have the agent's face and phone number on them, right? Well, the mother had a sign in a yard near Holly's grandmother's house. Gerald liked to stalk his ex, so it made sense for him to be in the area where she was selling houses. Dan kept digging. He found that Gerald's rape victim had grown up in 
moved near Coleman's Pond where Molly went missing. Gerald lived in Warren at the same time. An ex-wife said that Gerald used to cut through Whiskey Hill to buy drugs from his dealer in Warren. He knew the area like the back of his hand. Many women who were involved with Gerald told the same story. He was charming at first, but their relationship usually ended with a restraining order. They were terrified of him and his violent tendencies. While interviewing Gerald's second wife, Dan found another interesting clue. Apparently, Gerald fixed her car, a white Chevy. The day Molly disappeared, she says Gerald took the car out for a spin, which she found odd. Gerald's second wife also hated the way he smoked, the feminine way he held his cigarette, used to drive her crazy. Maggie Bish never could shake the memory of the mustachioed man holding his cigarette the same way. Gerald had a mustache leading up to Molly's disappearance, but shaved it after she went missing. He spent most of his time on the couch and didn't like talking about Molly's case. He'd deflect the conversation, saying, sometimes there's just no evidence. It turns out Gerald was working as an informant for a drug task force in Central Mass. Maybe he felt he could fly under the radar if he kept himself close to the law. His role might have gone to his head. Twice, Gerald was accused of impersonating a police officer. Molly's family and the police theorized that someone she trusted may have approached her that day. It explains why her stuff was untouched and there were no signs of a struggle. You don't just grab someone off a lifeguard chair. You'd have to lure them away. It's possible that Gerald, while dressed as a cop, convinced Molly to come with him that day. Dan's investigation revealed lots of circumstantial evidence, but nothing directly linking Gerald to Molly's murder. He did serve time in prison for raping his girlfriend's daughter. In 2011, when his name circulated as a suspect in the Molly Bish case, Gerald tried to kill himself in prison. He died three years later of an unrelated illness. When Dan learned about Gerald's passing, he said he wasn't the type to rejoice in the death of another. Still, he was comforted that Gerald would never hurt anyone again. The world was safer without him. Our final suspect is Rodney Stanger, a former Massachusetts resident who killed his girlfriend in 2008. Before moving to Florida, Rodney lived in Southbridge, Massachusetts, about 14 miles southeast of Warren and right next door to Sturbridge. He stayed there for 20 years with his girlfriend, Crystal Morrison. Then, in 2001, they packed up and moved to Florida. It's not uncommon, but strange given the circumstances. In 2008, Rodney stabbed and decapitated her in their trailer home. He was sentenced to 25 to life and is currently rotting in prison. After the murder, Crystal's sister went through the dilapidated home to gather some things. Inside, she found Rodney's wallet containing cash and his Massachusetts gun license. The photo resembled the composite sketch of Molly Bishop killer. Before Crystal died, she hinted that Rodney had killed people in Massachusetts. Perhaps she couldn't live with the secret any longer, and maybe she wanted to go to the police, but Rodney stopped her. The sister also found kids' things, like barrettes and hair scrunchies, things Crystal would never wear. They had no kids, and there were never any children around their trailer. She alerted Massachusetts police, who began digging into Rodney's past. Rodney had access to a white car, similar to the one Maggie saw. He was known to fish in Coman's pond and hunt in Whiskey Hill. The spot where they found Molly's body wasn't easy to get to. According to her sister Heather, the killer brought Molly up a steep mountain. Someone had to know the area to get there and back safely. They were either a hunter or a woodsman. Rodney fit both descriptions. As of 2023, neither Rodney nor Gerald have been named as people of interest in Molly's case. All her family wants are answers. Molly's parents began the Molly Bish Foundation to raise awareness about child safety and abductions. Heather has taken to TikTok to spread the word about her sister. Now, we often put ourselves in the victim's shoes when we hear these stories, but family members still go through significant trauma. Before Molly's death, Heather used to think there were just a few bad apples in the bunch. Now, 23 years later, she remains on high alert. She looks at the men delivering her mail, fixing her car, and coaching her kids' soccer team. You never know what's going on inside their heads. Heather sees things differently now. She only sees sees the monsters. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.